Hi, everybody. I'm Landon Brooks with Heartlands Conservancy. I am our communications and engagement manager. And uh, today we have something special for you guys. Uh, we are going to do a little webinar, um, Gardening with Natives, with Elizabeth Wally, who is a University of Illinois um, Extension educator. So, um, but first, before we do that, I want to kind of fill you in on a few of the things that Heartlands has going on right now. Um, the first of which is our next volunteer day. It's actually going to be at the Signal Hill outdoor classroom tomorrow morning um, from 8 to 10 a.m. Uh, we also have another volunteer day coming up uh, next Friday at Poke Sand Prairie in Edwardsville. Um, and it's also um, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Um, and then we are going to do another little webinar um, next week talking about rain barrels with upcycle products. Um, who are the distributors of our rain barrels for um, our fall native plant rain barrel and composter sale. And um, also uh, we are gonna announce later today, um, a little something special. It, we're bringing back our um, hiking club. So that is gonna be September 12th. We will announce um, the time and the location after a while. So stay tuned to our Facebook page for that. Um, but yeah, today we are gonna uh, talk to Elizabeth about um, all the plants in our uh, fall native plant sale. And um, so I will turn it over to Elizabeth. Very nice to see you this morning. Same here, Landon. Yeah, Elizabeth um, is uh, not only a University of Illinois um, Extension educator, but she also teaches um, sessions for the Master Gardener and the Master uh, Naturalist programs. Well, Landon, I, I think we can add add to that that I'm an avid gardener as well. Yeah. And so one of the things that I do for um, our volunteers on a weekly basis while we're kind of restricted a little bit with COVID-19 is I do what's blooming in my jungle uh, right now. So that's what I call my jungle. Now um, for my main part of my job, I work with supporting the commercial fruit and vegetable industry. But uh, today I'm going to talk about one of my loves and that's gardening with native plants. So Lennon, if you'll go ahead and load us up, we'll start this up. So I want to start off and say I'd like to welcome you to today's discussion on gardening with native plants. Uh, today I'm going to discuss the 22 native species offered in the Heartland Conservancy's uh, inaugural fall native plant, green barrel, and compost for sale. So that's pretty exciting. And I believe, Lennon, that everything is going quite well so far. Now, before I get started, I'd like to also um, make you aware of a couple of volunteer programs that you might be interested in that are managed through the University of Illinois uh, Extension Service. And so um, our first one is Master Naturalist. These are for people who love to be outdoors, um, you have a concern for the local environment, or you want to provide education and service uh, to your local community. We do have a class beginning on September 3rd. Uh, we're taking applications currently, and those are due by August 24th. And so if you're interested, um, the website is here where you can get an application, or you can call the local office in Collinsville to get details. We also have our Master Gardener program, and these are for um, training to become horticulture experts, and these volunteers also serve their community service projects and delivery of educational programs. We have our traditional programming usually starts in January, but we have an online class beginning September 23rd. So if that's your preference uh, to do it online, we are taking applications for that as well. And those are due on August 31st and classes begin on September 23rd. So for now, um, let's move on and let's talk about plants. You know, the first one um, that's being offered, and I have these listed alphabetically by their scientific name. So um, that's their order. And so I'm going to start with wild ginger. And this is a plant that grows to about four to six inches tall. It's an excellent choice as a ground cover for shady conditions. Um, it naturally forms dense colonies through underground shoots and thus should be cited where it has room to spread and fill in in bare areas. It definitely prefers consistently moist soils, um, but once it's established, it will tolerate drier conditions. 
usually flowers between April and May, but I'm gonna tell you, uh, unless you get down on your hands and knees, you're not going to see them. Um, it produces a maroon near red flower at the base of the plant that is usually obscured by the leaf. So um, it's not one of its features, it's the heart-shaped leaves and that has a nice mat of green that makes it most interesting. Now, an, Another feature that I find fascinating about uh, wild, wild ginger is that its seeds have a lysome on them. And that's a fatty structure uh, that is rich in proteins and lipids, and it is just irresistible to ants. And so the ants will come and harvest those seeds and take them back to their uh, nest, and they will eat off the lysome from the seed and toss the rest of the seed in the ant waste dump, so to speak. And so that effectively plants the seed. And so if you see this plant popping up a little further away than you were really expecting it to, you probably have an ant to thank. Now we have a, a couple of other plants that do this as well. So if you've had Dutchman's breeches or blood roots, those are two of many of our native plants that are also um, moved around by ants. Oak sedge um, is a very nice uh, planting um, and close planting to cover the ground. I'm going to say that it's commonly noticed, noted as being 15 to 20 inches tall, but that's really only if you were to take one of the grass blades and hold it vertically. Um, really, this is a plant that uh, tends to arch low over the soil. And so it effectively creates a plant that's only four to five uh, inches tall and really wide, 14 to 18 inches. So it's really an excellent choice for putting it in borders and filling in bare spaces around small perennials and preferably in um, semi-shaded uh, areas. So I'm saying that it does need some shade and really when it needs shade is not in the morning, but usually in the hot afternoon. So if you can cite it where you can give it a little bit of a cooler, um, area in the afternoon, it'll do better. Now, if you get it in too much sun, it's not a killer of the plant, but it will change its appearance. They have a tendency to be a little more yellow green in color when they're in, in full afternoon sun. So though it doesn't like consistently wet feet, uh, oak sedge works well for rain garden slopes. So not down where the water sits all the time, um, but on the slopes, it's also a very good choice for bioswells or as a ground cover. Pennsylvania sedge is our next one. Um, and as alluded to in the previous slide, um, most sedges do prefer consistently moist to wet soils, but definitely not this one. Um, it doesn't like wet feet and really performs best in a well-drained soil. Um, this sedge spreads slowly via underground and it forms a dense dark green turf, uh, making it really suitable as a low growing ground cover or a just stunningly beautiful no-mo turf. Um, you'll want to site this sedge where it won't receive hot afternoon sun as well, um, but rather light sun to light shade. Now river oats, I just find this to just be a beautiful grass um, and it's most notable for its flattened panicles of, you know, the flattened spikelets as you see in the little inset picture. Uh, it does well in most light conditions, and I'm going to say all light conditions except for deep shade. Um, it's not a good place to put it. And though it's tolerant of poorer soils once established, it really prefers a well-drained uh, average to moist soil conditions. And as mentioned, this is such a beautiful grass. I'm going to put a little caveat on this that you might be willing to overlook. Um, it has a tendency to reseed and if you plant this, you need to be prepared ahead of time that it will reseed and you may need to do some editing um, out it. I, I really do recommend that you site this where it can spread though, um, because the unwanted seedlings are not the easiest to remove. So they're well anchored. But on the other hand, um, river oats is a really great choice for stabilizing soil um, because it is so well anchored. So if you have a site that you know, you're having a hard time keeping the soil in place, river oats might be a very good choice for you. It also works well on rain garden slopes um, in bioswells or basins or as a ground cover. This is another of the 
showy flowers that I just love. So Miss Flower does have the showy flowers, which are attractive to bees and butterflies. And it really fills that niche of late blooming pollinator plant. And so if you're looking for plants that bloom later in the season to, to offer your pollinators a, a nectar and pollen source, this would be a good choice. I will say, be warned though, it does have a reputation of spreading aggressively when it's in its happy place. Uh, and its happy place is wet, fertile soils that don't dry out. So if you put it in a soil that stays wet all the time, it has a tendency to really take off and let you know it's happy. Um, for this reason, um, I recommend caution in siding mist flower in a moist formal bed. Um, it just may not stay where you want it to. Um, instead, site it where it's free to spread. And that means like rain garden or other less formal planting where it's less likely uh, to become a pest. Now pictured here is where I've planted it. I planted it in a I'm not going to say dry, but uh, not as wet site. And so if you site it where it's not got um, an abundant so supply of moisture, that does seem to hold it back and it still blooms quite beautifully. Pale purple coneflower. Wow. Um, it just makes you want to wax poetic when it's in bloom. So, you know, swaying with the wind currents. Um, pale purple coneflower blooms are held high above on large tufts of foliage on really long slender stems. And this makes them excellent for cut flowers and that's both fresh or dried. Um, it's showy and fragrant. Um, our blooms are preferred nectar source for a number of butterflies and bees. Um, I will see birds perching uh, on these quite regularly too, but they um, are on such uh, long stems. It's kind of interesting to watch them bob up and down with the movement of the flowers. Um, it's also an excellent choice for prairie restoration projects, providing pollinator nesting materials or as a caterpillar host plant. And though it's similar in color to our native purple cone flower, the ray flowers of the pale purple cone flower are thinner and reflexed in comparison. Um, you're going to want to site this plant on a well-drained average to dry soil. The yellow cone flower um, has features very similar to both the purple cone flower and the pale purple cone flower, only in yellow. Um, it doesn't have the wiry stems of pale purple cone flower. It's more stiff, um, like the purple cone flower. Blooms are showy and fragrant, um, and again, very attractive to pollinators and birds. It does prefer a well-drained soil in full sun, and it can be used similarly to the other native cone flowers. Um, both as a wildflower for prairie restoration projects, providing pollinator nesting materials, or as a caterpillar host plant. Um, again, another beautiful uh, Illinois native. Now, if you do have wet, you're definitely going to want to have a blue iris. And so if you do have that consistently wet site, um, consider this plant. Um, it prefers wet, rich soil in full sun uh, to light shade and it performs best when the rhizomes are shallowly submerged. So if you really have a lot of water, um, this will hold up to it. Um, it's best used for basins, uh, rain gardens. So when I say rain gardens, I mean where, where the water sits, um, bioswells or the edge of a pond. <coughs> Excuse me. But just because it, it prefers wet doesn't mean that it isn't tolerant of normal garden soils. And so um, you can actually plant these in formal beds as well, as long as you keep the mulch and the soil is, is very organic rich. I'm going to say that the blooms can range in color uh, from light blue to shades of purple, and they're very attractive to bees and hummingbirds. This is one of my more favorite groups. I, you know, I can just stand and stare at Li Liatris. Um, they're just beautiful. And they are just absolute magnets for um, butterflies, bees, and hummingbirds. And so um, this one is the Prairie Blazing Star, and it definitely is no exception. It is equally beautiful to all the other Liatris. Um, <coughs> excuse me. It performs best on moist, uh, fertile, well-drained soil in full sun, typically reaches a height between three and four feet, 
I'm going to say that one of the things I've noticed in growing these and others have noted as well, when they're young, uh, they have a tendency to lodge over, meaning that they need to be staked when um, they're first planted and into the early years. But as they get some age on them, um, they, they really kind of get um, some stiffness to the stems and are pretty freestanding. Uh, so be prepared to stake uh, this tall, beautiful plant. This is known by a lot of different names, Prairie Blazing Star, Great Blazing Star, and you'll notice with a lot of the liatris that they have multiple regional names. The next liatris is Eastern Blazing Star, also known, known as Devil's Bite or Northern Gay Feather. Um, this one grows tall as well, um, three to five feet tall. Um, this is absolutely a monarch magnet. So anytime you're around it, you're gonna see monarchs uh, on it. It's also attractive to other butterflies, bees, and hummingbirds. And it's not uncommon to see uh, dragonflies resting, I'm gonna say rather majestically on the terminal flower head throughout the day. Um, performs best in dry to average well-drained soil and full sun. Um, the Eastern Blazing Star tends to be more shade and drought tolerant um, than the previous uh, Prairie Blazing Star that I mentioned. And like many tall plants, um, staking is going to be needed the first few years after establishment uh, to prevent that lodging. <coughs> Spike Blazing Star is a, a little bit smaller plant. It usually um, grows um, up to two to four feet tall, but it is absolutely no less attractive to birds, butterflies, and bees. Um, it prefers a moist, well-drained soil in full sun, making a good choice for basins, rain garden slopes, or a bioswell. And even though it's the most adapted blazing star for moist soils, it is intolerant of wet winter soil. And we have a number of plants that um, are like that. They prefer to have moist soils during the summer, but not during the winter. So this is one of them. Cardinal flower is just beautiful. And I'm going to say that it has been said that the good die young. And that's definitely true of cardinal flower um, when it is not sited um, in its happy place. So it's considered relatively short lived. Um, but if you site it where it likes to be, which is in wet soils, it has a tendency to uh, continue receding and, and can be very long lived. And so with cardinal flower, it's all about maintaining constant soil moisture and not allowing the soil to dry. Um, this extremely showy cardinal red flowers are very attractive to hummingbirds and butterflies. Um, but I'm going to say don't let its potentially shorter life keep you from adding this to your garden. Uh, it's definitely worth adding it to a rain garden slopes, um, a basin or a bioswell where it's more likely to thrive. So if <coughs> the previous cardinal flower is a statement in red, um, and it definitely is, um, the blue cardinal flower makes an equal statement in bright blue. And I'm going to say maybe with a hint of lavender. So it's not an electric blue, but it does have a slight lavender cast. Um, similarly, it also needs constant moisture under full sun to part shade, um, making it a great addition to the rain garden slopes, basins, or bioswells. But unlike cardinal flower, blue cardinal flower is longer lived. Um, and when it's in its happy Place, it will reseed and form really attractive colonies. So I consider this to be um, not quite as fussy as the red cardinal flower. Uh, I have this throughout my gardens and it's not always um, moist. That's what it does prefer, but the red cardinal flower definitely uh, requires constant moisture. When we look at foxglove beer tongue, uh, this is a plant you just need one to get started, um, but you can definitely plant more if you want um, bigger impact quicker. Um, I really like foxglove beer, beer tongue because it, it readily receives and forms really nice colonies wherever planted. Um, the seed pods themselves are reddish in color and tend to um, weigh the stem down. And when that happens, um, that allows the seeds to drop a few feet from the mother plant, and that's what causes um, the colony development. So if you don't want as much reseeding, just deadhead, 
um, the seed pods and the stems will return to upright. And so um, this is one that, you know, when we mark it as reseeding, I don't find this to be challenging to control, control its spread in the garden. Um, it is a prolific nectar producer um, and visited by a huge diversity of butterflies, moths, bees, and hummingbirds. It's very widely adapted to dry to average soil uh, under full sun to part shade. And I will say that it's probably in all of those conditions in my garden and does equally well. So it's very useful in rain garden slopes and other waterways like a bioswell as well. You know, when you're talking about Slender Mountain Mint, I think all you can say is this is a pollinator magnet. Um, Guys, just pull up your lawn chair and just watch everything that comes to visit this plant. And that's probably true of most of the mountain mints. They just really um, are pollinator magnets. It definitely is a bee favorite. Um, so its shallow nectaries are also attractive to um, things like beneficial solitary wasps, flies, beetles, and small butterflies. Um, the slender mountain mint is best adapted to dry to average soil uh, under full sun to part shade. It's really an excellent choice for rain garden slopes or other open areas near ponds or streams. And as the common name implies, mint, um, it can spread vegetatively through rhizomes forming colonies of closely bunched plants. This is another one that does spread, um, but I've really not found um, too much effort needs to be um, put into it to control its size or, or where it spreads to. Our next one is gray-headed coneflower, and this is um, one that, of our many attractive uh, native yellow daisies. Um, plants are good size, reaching uh, three to four feet tall, and they pair very well with other tall uh, perennials. They have very showy blooms, uh, June through July, and they're very attractive to bees and butterflies. I'm gonna say that this plant performs best with average soil moisture under full uh, to part sun, and the root system is rhizomatous, and it often forms tight clumps of plants. So this is a plant that I, um, again, need to come in um, and remove a few plants here and there uh, just to control its spread. Now our orange cone flower in this picture is uh, in the front is cardinal flower to the back. The yellow daisy is the orange cone flower. Um, this plant is another one of our yellow daisies, but smaller in stature, um, two to three feet tall. So orange cone flower blooms later uh, than the previous gray headed cone flower, usually August through September, um, but again, equally attractive to bees and butterflies. It prefers constant soil moisture and full sun to produce the best flower displays. Um, so this is an excellent choice for rain garden slopes again, or other waterways, <coughs> excuse me, like a bioswell. So once established, the plant will um, spread slowly via rhizomes to form um, a really attractive colony. So it just kind of creeps out um, rather than popping up all over the place. So again, rather easy to um, control where, where it is spreading to. <coughs> so we have the three-leaved stone crop and straight and simple. Um, this is a succulent ground cover um, that really works well along paths or in a rock garden. It's best adapted to an average while drained soil under full sun to part shade. Um, it blooms in May as you see pictured here. Um, very showy and very attractive to bees and butterflies. And comparing it to all the other sedums that are on the market, um, our native three-leaf sedum is more tolerant of part shade and moist soil. I just think cliff goldenrod is just beautiful. And so this is a, an interesting goldenrod for its use in native plant gardens, rock gardens, or borders um, where it where it can be displayed for its cascading uh, characteristic. Uh, the individual stems grow one, one and a half to three feet long um, with blooms occurring September and October. So they're just getting ready to come into bloom here fairly soon. Um, as you can see, the blooms are quite showy. 
and are very attractive to bees and butterflies. So we're moving into these um, plants that you're looking for for a later season when other things are starting to fade away. This is a good choice. Um, Cliff Goldenrod prefers dry to average soil uh, under sun to part shade. <coughs> Our next goldenrod is zigzag goldenrod. And it gets its name because it has a tendency to zigzag between the alternate leaves, but not always. Um, this is one of the most shade tolerant goldenrods, uh, preferring light to medium shade on dry to moist soils, uh, making it really useful in a woodland planting um, that has dappled sunlight. Uh, its showy bloom occurs August into October, so this one has started to bloom already in our area. And like other goldenrods, it is still very attractive to bees and butterflies. Moving into our asters, I think when people think of the fall, they think of asters and mums. So let's talk about um, our first one, the New England aster. So when you have straight species, um, it grows three to five feet tall. Now you're going to find on the market that they have uh, used our native and there are a number of uh, cultivated um, selections out there too that uh, adjust, you know, usually they're shorter in stature um, and, and more suitable to a smaller garden. But when we're talking about the straight species, New England aster is prized for its late season burst of color and its value as a pollinator plant uh, when most everything else has faded. Uh, not only are the flowers showy from September into October and attractive to hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees, but the plant serves as a larval host for a number of um, butterflies and moths. So as I mentioned, uh, this grows three to five feet, um, prefers consistently moist soils anywhere from average to moist under full sun to medium shade. Now I'm going to add a special note, and you're used to doing this with mums, but it, it, it works also with New England aster. Um, the heavy bloom tends to lodge the plant open. Uh, uh, lodge the plant over. So if you want to um, pinch the top buds occasionally until, uh, you know, early summer, and that is running probably up to early June, um, this will result in a bushier plant that's less likely to lodge. So you can do the same pinching that you do for mums on this aster to get a um, bushier plant. This one I just absolutely love. You know, when everything else is starting, and I've, I've purposely shown some fall pictures here, um, when everything else is starting to fade and taking on a look of fall, um, that's when aromatic asker just really um, is showy. Um, it's a fabulous pollinator plant and definitely one of the last to bloom. And so bloom occurs from October into November, um, highly attractive to any pollinators still out there. So um, when you stand by it on a day that's warm enough, you, the air is just filled with little little insects flying everywhere. Uh, aromatic aster readily recedes and should be deadheaded or cut back if that's an undesirable outcome. Um, plant in well-drained, average to dry soils under full sun to light shade. And just as an added note, the name aromatic uh, aster refers to the balsam-like aroma um, that's emitted from the crushed foliage or flower heads. So um, the flowers themselves have no noticeable scent. So it is the scent of the crushed leaves that uh, gives it its name. So I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about some of our Illinois native plants and that you'll take advantage of the sale um, going on right now. Um, talked about how best to incorporate them in your plant scheme. And in closing, I'm going to wish you happy gardening until our paths cross again. So this is Elizabeth Wally with University of Illinois Extension. Landon, I think I'm going to hand it back over to you. All right. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say a few things. First of all, thank you so much for all the information today. I've got to say, um, so I did the Master Gardener program this spring, um, and I'm actually going to do the Master Naturals program this fall. I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, but um, every time we get in our little master gardener meetings and Elizabeth shows us which, uh, what's growing in her garden, I mean, it's, it's incredible. And just the knowledge that you have is, is amazing. Um, the, other, the other thing I want to say is uh, what I'm really excited about, particularly 
for this plant sale is that um you know we're offering a lot of items that you can't really find in uh the stores um some of them will be offered in some of your local uh locally owned um nurseries and stuff but um for the most part none of these can really be found in you know your home depots or lowe's or, or big box stores um and so this is a really good opportunity to get some of those items I know for me, um, what I was most excited about when we were, we were talking about the sale and planning for it, um, you know, the uh, pale cone flowers, the southern blue flag iris, yellow cone flowers, and gray headed cone flowers. I was, I'm like, I mean, I've never seen those, you know, before. Um, and then, like you, you were talking about the asters, like the true asters, um, which are the most beautiful ball plants, in my opinion, that we have around here. Um, you know, you can, you can get varieties of them here and there, but, um, but these are going to be really incredible for your well, garden. I, I'll add to your comments because they're very true on, on sourcing plant materials. It's even more difficult to source the straight species. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot, a lot of what is available um, on the market are improved cultivars, um, you know, usually for reducing stature to make them dwarf. So if you're looking for straight species, this is an excellent opportunity to get them. Thank you. Yeah. And then um, also, you know, we do uh, have rain barrels available and we also have composters. So if those are some items that you're looking for, um, you know, to improve your garden, we've got those too. And um, yeah, so uh, I encourage everybody, if you're interested in these kind of things, definitely go through the master naturalist program this fall. Um, I'll be in it. Like I said, um, it's just a great opportunity to learn more and network with people that are also interested in this. And that's one of the things I find valuable um, about the master gardener program. And I'm sure I'll find, you know, with the master naturalist program, it's a great bunch of people to be around and to learn from. And um, there's just so much to learn. So um, with that, I will, um, I guess wish everybody a happy rest of your week and uh, look out for our hiking club announcement later on. And I will put the link to the plant sale and the link to sign up to be a master naturalist um, in the comment section. So, yep, I guess uh, everybody have a wonderful day. Thanks again, Elizabeth. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Landon. All right. Bye.